Uh, good evening, and uh, thanks for joining me for this somewhat of a dry topic. Uh, no pun intended. Uh, my name uh, is David Graham. I'm a hand surgeon based uh, in Brisbane and the Gold Coast, Australia. Uh, thank you to Carlos for uh, asking me to give this talk. Uh, and thank you to Carlos and the Paul Vataft uh, Hand Centre for running these, these talks. They're uh, amazing resources, and I've watched uh, many of my mentors give fantastic talks. And it's an absolute honour to be asked to give this one today. I must admit, uh, given the calibre of previous talks, it is certainly daunting to be uh, talking on a topic that I'm uh, not an expert in. Uh, but nonetheless, I think it is important that we as surgeons do discuss um, these conditions. I have no declarations of interest uh, relevant to this topic. The only disclosure is that I'm not a dermatologist, I'm not an expert in the field, and I do apologise to anyone who knows more about this uh, than, than me. So I'll be no, making no rash, rash decisions uh, today. So we as hand surgeons are often uh, at the coalface of hand pathology with the uh, new referrals coming from emergency departments or from the general practitioners. And I've certainly heard that old adage whispered around um, orthopedics and uh, hand surgery in general that when we come across something that we're not sure uh, about, when in doubt, cut it out. Uh, now, this may work for a lot of pathology, but it's definitely not the correct approach for everything. And I hope to show you that uh, today. Um, perhaps the old saying is true, when all you've got is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Or maybe when all you've got is a scalpel, everything looks like it needs a debridement. So what I'll attempt to cover briefly today is covered in more detail in this paper that we had published in JHS in uh, June 2022. Uh, and I'll refer you to that uh, for more detail. And I'd like to acknowledge the co-authors, Brahman Sivakumar, uh, Nick Stewart, and uh, Neil Jones, uh, who are on that paper. Uh, given I'm not an expert uh, on the topic, I've uh, asked Nick Stewart, who is a, a fantastic dermatologist, uh, and Moe's micrographic surgeon who works out of Sydney Skin Hospital to join me in this talk and I'm sure he'll be able to give a much more comprehensive overview of the topic than myself. So why is this hand surgeon, hand surgeon rubbing on about dermatology? After all, we know, right, if it's wet, make it dry. If it's dry, make it wet. And if that doesn't work, try steroids. Um, well, believe it or not, dermatology can affect us as hand surgeons and more importantly can affect our patients. Uh, how can it do this? Uh, well, some conditions uh, need to be uh, optimized prior to surgery to minimize the risk uh, of, of infections, uh, such as the acute and chronic skin lesions. Um, very little evidence exists uh, regarding uh, the exact risk of hand surgery in patients with skin lesions. Uh, we know uh, that hand surgeons are often reluctant to operate on patients with active psoriasis, for example, for risk of uh, post-operative infection and wound healing issues. We do know that there's a relative increase in the load of streptococcus and staphylococcus in psoriatic skin. Two retrospective studies with small cohort numbers assessing knee and hip arthroplasty in patients with psoriasis showed an increased risk of post-operative complications, including skin necrosis, hematoma, psoriasis exacerbation, and skin infection. And that was in 1989 by Sturm and 1983 by Manon. Conversely, when assessing similar cohorts, Young in 2017 reported no increased risks of infection or impairment in all wound healing in their series of 164 patients who had traumatic wounds. Secondly, some conditions can be managed medically and may not actually require surgical intervention. A good example of this is certain types of chronic paronychia. We as surgeons, uh, in my experience, when we've come across a chronic paronychia that hasn't responded, uh, treat this by removing the nail plate and marsupialization. Whereas dermatologists often manage these, these cases as more of an irritant dermatitis picture with meticulous hand hygiene, avoidance of the detergents, minimizing hand washing, uh, using a soap-free wash, moisturizing, and of course, topical steroids. Uh, 
Some uh, conditions that we come across may have implications for musculoskeletal pathology, such as psoriasis and the correlation with psoriatic arthritis. And lastly, some conditions may mimic surgical pathology. And this is really what we want to touch on today. And the big thing is that I wasn't aware for a, while, for a long time was that some conditions can be made significantly worse by surgery and by us getting involved. Uh, and obviously we have to remember our principle of first do no harm. So why did I start looking into this? Uh, after a series of patients who have been referred and had suboptimal treatment and outcomes due to a lack of appreciation and awareness of these conditions, I decided to look into this a little further. I discussed it with uh, Nick, who's a good friend and, and yeah. colleague of mine uh, and is a dermatologist. And we started to look uh, through some of the cases that have come through our hospitals uh, and realized that it's probably a widespread problem in surgery. Uh, initially, I thought this might just be me. Maybe I skipped the, uh, the lecture in medical school uh, on this condition. But as I started to, to talk to more and more people, uh, certainly in orthopedics and uh, in surgery in general, I realized that this isn't something that we do particularly well. Uh, and I think it's worth discussing, even though it's something that's uh, not the most uh, interesting area to surgeons to talk about dermatology. I think it's important for the sake of our patients to really have a, a somewhat basic understanding of these conditions. So this uh, photo here is an example, and I appreciate it's not a hand case, uh, but this is often uh, shown in dermatology meetings. So this is a patient who had a presumed uh, abdominal infection post cesarean section. Uh, then the obstetrics team and then general surgery kept abriding it thinking this is an aggressive necrotizing infection uh, until someone finally calls dermatology. Uh, and you can see there's a huge amount of iatrogenic damage here. And then this condition can be managed medically. But obviously by this time, there's already large skin loss requiring coverage. So here's a classic example. Uh, it's an emergency department call. Uh, you have a 50 year old female who's, who's been scratched by a cat. Uh, she's been treated by a GP. It was three weeks ago. She's been on oral antibiotics. She's not improving. Uh, lab studies show an increase uh, in her white cells with a neutrophilia and elevated CRP. So what should we do? Should we uh, admit and try intravenous antibiotics? Should we change the spectrum of the antibiotic? Should we get an ultrasound to look for a collection that needs to be drained? Should we admit and elevate? Should we debride in theater and then uh, plan for coverage? Now I realize this image on the right might give uh, many surgeons the nightmares of their flashbacks back to the medical school days. But the condition we're really talking about here is neutrophilic dermatosis. And what neutrophilic dermatosis is, is a spectrum of skin diseases that are unified by an inflammatory infiltrate consisting of polymorphonuclear leukocytes that can be somewhat differentiated based on the location in the skin of this infiltrate. So it's a continuum uh, and it's uh, there's various sub uh, groups that have been described and it largely goes beyond what we need to know as surgeons, more just to know that these conditions exist. The ones that we will probably come across and briefly discuss, uh, sweet syndrome, so acute febrile neutrophilic dermatosis, uh, neutrophilic dermatosis of the dorsal hand, and pyoderma gangrenosum. So sweet syndrome was described in 1964 by Rob, Robert Douglas Sweet, and he described this acute febrile neutrophilic dermatosis. It's a hypersensitivity reaction that occurs in response to systemic factors. And these can be multiple that we'll discuss in more detail. It's the key is it's neutrophil mediated and they have the capacity to heal without any scarring. And this is due to the injury and the infiltrate being superficial to the epidermal dermal junction. And there are stem cells here that can repopulate the skin and allow it to heal without scarring. So in sweet syndrome, the infiltration is superficial. Um, it's really of the papillary and upper uh, retinacular layers of the dermis, and it can be associated with uh, upper respiratory uh, tract infections, uh, GI infections, inflammatory bowel disease, such as Crohn's, uh, or ulcerative colitis, uh, certain malignancies that we'll touch on, 
and certain medications have been implicated also. So sweet sy uh, symptoms of sweets syndrome, uh, painful bumps or blisters uh, filled with pus, uh, skin lesions, discoloration, fever, joint aches, a general feeling of unwell, uh, and headache and fatigue. So you can see how this is very easily confused with a, uh, an infection and particularly a systemic infection. And uh, often we can be tricked into thinking this needs uh, aggressive debridement for this. Uh, it can be classified. Uh, the most common uh, subtype is the classic type, uh, which occurs in young women uh, without any underlying uh, disorders. They may follow an infection of the upper respiratory tract or GI tract, and it may be associated with pregnancy. Uh, the second group is uh, malignancy associated, and this is about a quarter of cases, and we'll talk about that in a second. And the last group, which is the least uh, f uh, common, is uh, the drug-induced uh, form, and uh, we'll discuss the drugs in a second. Uh, sweet syndrome can be diagnosed based on major and minor criteria. The, uh, to, for a diagnosis, you have both of the major and two of the minor criteria. Uh, with major criteria being the abrupt onset of these typical skin lesions, characteristic histopathological, histopathological features, and the minor criteria uh, being increased inflammatory markers, constitutional symptoms, inflammatory or malignant disease history, and the responsiveness to corticosteroid therapy. And really my history, uh, it's really the responsiveness to corticosteroid therapy that really uh, is the, the key. Always be uh, aware of, of differentials. Uh, it classically doesn't present such like a acute staph infection that we might see, but an atypical infection, be that either bacterial, fungal, or viral, may present uh, like this. Obviously, malignancies and uh, and traumas, particularly if uh, if they've been neglected, uh, may present with um, with these types of wound breakdowns. It's really all in the history, uh, which I know for surgeons is not what we really like doing. Um, it's the, the time frame that this is presented. Uh, for example, malignancies don't occur uh, rapidly like these would. Uh, it's the unusual presentation. So something just doesn't look or sound quite right. So you can usually tell uh, just from the history, from the emergency referral, it's the, the classic white-tailed spider. Uh, when you ask the patient, hope they actually seen a spider. They they often haven't. And they just assume they've been bitten by a spider because this lesions come up. Um, have they had previous lesions like this in the past? That might give us a clue. Have they had a preceding recent upper respiratory or GI infection? And have they had the usual treatments that haven't worked, like uh, antibiotics, um, etc. So the malignancy or underlying condition associated with sweet syndrome is often associated with hematological malignancies, the leukemias, myelodysplasia, uh, rarely cancers of the GI system or the, a, um, a genitourinary system, uh, Hodgkin's and non-Hodgkin's lymphomas, multiple myeloma, etc. Can also be associated with inflammatory bowel disease. Uh, and the key take home message is that a new diagnosis of neutrophilic dermatosis should be referred to a dermatologist or a physician to work up for these uh, potential underlying causes uh, as they have a risk of uh, them coming back. And also if you don't deal with the uh, underlying cause, you will uh, not be treating the condition properly. Uh, there's various drugs that have been uh, associated with the drug-induced form of sweet syndrome. Uh, the most common ones that we will be uh, exposed to as hand surgeons are Bactrim and the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory group, but uh, these other medications, minocycline, uh, granulocyte CSF, uh, etc., can uh, also be involved in drug-induced forms. And once you stop that drug, it usually uh, resolves the condition. So back to our case, the patient had a history of trauma. It can't be neutrophilic dermatosis, right? Well, un unfortunately, no. Uh, a proportion of patients with neutrophilic dermatosis will have a preceding history of local trauma. And this uh, is the process called pathogy, uh, the process whereby skin injury may precede inflammatory disease at that site. And Kobnerization or the Kobner phenomenon is similar uh, 
And this is the uh, refers to the process of the extension of a cutaneous disease along areas of trauma uh, in previously uninvolved skin. And this can uh, affect this can be associated with multiple skin uh, conditions such as psoriasis, vitiligo, etc. So back to our patient, uh, she had a biopsy which confirmed this dense neutrophilic dermal uh, uh, infiltrate. She had oral prednisone, and uh, within two weeks, you can see the rapid improvement here on the bottom. So moving on to pyoderma gangrenosum, this is an, a, uh, another subtype of neutrophilic dermatosis, which typically presents with large, painful purulent ulcers with advancing zones of erythema. Again, very uh, similar to a history of infection. Uh, these are again, frequently associated with inflammatory bowel disease and rheumatoid arthritis. And the difference here is that the infiltrate is deeper than in sweet syndrome. So it's full thickness ulceration and uh, it heals with cribriform scarring as opposed to the sweets. Neutrophilic dermatosis of the hand uh, is another subvariant that we will come across. It has violet papules and nodules and plaques on the dorsum of the hand usually, but it can occur on the volar side. And they have epidermal changes with necrosis and alteration. And again, they may have a preceding history of trauma. And here's another example uh, treated with steroids with uh, excellent resolution and rapid resolution. So for neutrophilic dermatosis, uh, if in doubt, you can cut some out, but don't cut it all out. Don't be aggressive. Uh, a full thickness biopsy is, uh, is recommended, and that's at the junction of normal and abnormal tissue. Uh, I do that with a scalpel. Uh, the dermatologists often do it with a punch biopsy. Uh, either way is fine. Uh, then you send it for uh, your, your MCNS and include on those the atypicals, like the fungals the, and the viral growths and for uh, histopathology uh, and avoid being overly aggressive with the biopsy because you don't want to exacerbate the lesion. Uh, so you can see how the history uh, really can be confused with infection and it's, it's our job really to uh, exclude an infection with the biopsy. Now you get your histopathology back which I'm sure makes us all feel uncomfortable looking at this slide and reminds us of days back in medical school and it confirms a neutrophilic infiltrate and sometimes, depending on where you are, you may need to get a specialist dermatopathologist involved to help uh, with, the, um, with the sections. So how do you treat it? Uh, systemic corticosteroids is the mainstay of treatment, usually at a dose of 0.5 milligrams per kilo once a day. And this usually results in a rapid and prompt response uh, to the uh, resolution of the, of the uh, lesion. Uh, there are other medications such as your dapsone and culture scenes, which have anti-neutrophilic properties. But again, I think this gets beyond uh, the realm of a hand surgeon. And I think if you're, you're starting with steroids, that would be uh, more than enough. The take home message again is that a new diagnosis uh, of neutrophilic dermatosis needs a review of a physician uh, or a dermatologist to make sure that they are fully worked up for these uh, other conditions and underlying pathologies. The other take home message is that surgical debridement of neutrophilic dermatosis exacerbates the lesion. So uh, don't be too aggressive um, and make sure you take a, uh, a, a biopsy for culture and um, histopathology. So here are some of the examples of cases that have come across, um, uh, that I've come across. Uh, that have turned out to be neutrophilic dermatosis. Uh, just showing you the wide variety of the presentations and they all have that uh, unusual appearance. And again, like we said before, it's usually in the history that gives this away uh, if something is not quite right. Here you see this uh, finger uh, looking quite nasty, it was referred as an infection. We gave uh, anybody, sorry, we gave steroids and uh, within two days, it's rapidly uh, resolving, uh, similar to these two. So here's another example from the literature. There's a 51 year old female. She has diabetes, <clears throat> which is poorly controlled, uh, and she has a routine open carpal tunnel release. Postoperatively, at the first uh, review, they think there's an infection. She has an elevated white cell count. CRP is normal, and they book for debridement and, uh, and antibiotics. Uh, Unfortunately, it worsens. They think she's got a necrotizing infection. The white cells go up. Uh, there's nothing on the growths. Uh, she, they send her for atypicals this time. Uh, 
uh, and they go and they uh, think, well, this is getting worse. We need to debride it more. And then she comes back looking like this. Uh, unfortunately, again, uh, she gets debrided. Uh, and you can, you can see by this stage, uh, things are not looking uh, fantastic. Uh, eventually someone uh, tweaks that this may not be uh, a post-op infection. They start prednisone. Uh, and then you can see the rapid improvements uh, following on to 60 days following the prednisone. And this is the final outcome at a year with no further surgery than what we had. And this is a case of pyodemic gangrenosum. Uh, and it can obviously look and present like a, a nasty post-operative infection. This is the last case I'll uh, show you. Uh, this is a 34-year-old male um, builder referred from a peripheral hospital uh, with a suspected alkali burn. Uh, they've had possible exposure to uh, cement concrete mix five days prior, and they've been started on empirical antibiotics. They present with this these otherwise well. It's got a neutrophilic uh, leukocytosis. CRP is mildly elevated. Uh, and then it becomes febrile, goes up to 38.1. They put him on tazacin IV, doesn't improve until again, finally someone starts thinking down the track that this may be uh, not uh, an infection and uh, the prednisone has started resulting in a rapid improvement and uh, final uh, lesions you can see here on the right. So again, this is the condition of pathogy, uh, which is that uh, uh, condition that can be associated with trauma and has been reported in sites of uh, veni venisection, biopsies, um, insect bites, thermal burns, etc. In 2015, there was a systematic review on uh, pyodema gangrenosum, and they looked at 220 reported cases. Uh, and of these, 12% occurred after orthopedic surgery, and the majority of these were hip and knee procedures, arthroplasties. But it's worth knowing that, noting that if you're not looking for this, it will be uh, it will be there, and you will miss it. Short um, comment on oral steroids. Uh, Obviously, you want to be aware of the, the blood sugar level, giving people oral steroids, particularly in diabetics who will be monitoring their blood sugar. Um, adverse effects, in my experience, rarely occur in short courses. Uh, this study back in uh, 1982 showed that it was uh, a sa a safe for short births. There have been these uh, two uh, more recent studies uh, looking at children and adults with the short births of uh, of uh, steroids and they report increased uh, odds ratios of uh, outcomes including GI bleeding and uh, sepsis and pneumonias. Um, however, we have to note that obviously the, the incidence of these is so small uh, that this is still a, a, a negligible uh, risk really and we have to weigh up the risk of uh, the lesion getting worse versus the, the risk of a side effect from our treatment. Of course, it's always a risk benefit consideration, uh, but I certainly uh, don't think that a short burst of uh, oral st <coughs> steroids is of, of huge risk. And I think largely uh, we as surgeons uh, are very worried about giving people steroids, which I don't think we should be. Uh, and I think Nick would um, support that. And uh, this is a study, this is not news, it's back from 1997, a randomized controlled trial that looked at antibiotic uh, and prednisone therapy versus uh, antibiotic treatment alone for erysipelas. And it showed that the outcomes are better when you combine the antibiotic and the prednisone. So I don't think even in the um, setting of infection that we should be worried about uh, giving um, prednisone. There's a good saying in ICU that no one should die without 50 milligrams of, of prednisone. So I think uh, one of our dogmas that you can't give uh, uh, steroids for the fear of it all getting uh, worse is not necessarily true. Uh, so pearls and pitfalls for neutrophilic dermatosis, it's all in the history. Um, it's the timeline, things just don't add up, they don't sound right. Beware of the white-tailed spider. Uh, look for a lack of response to things you'd normally expect to work for an infection like antibiotics uh, and oral prednisone results in a rapid resolution. Biopsy uh, these lesions, um, send them for atypicals, fungal histopathology at the junction of normal and abnormal tissue. And you can do this either with a scalpel or with a punch biopsy. I have a very low threshold to start oral prednisone, as I've said, uh, and that will really confirm in your mind that this is what you think it is. 
Uh, and if you're not sure, you can start with the oral steroids and with antibiotics to cover all bases. Obviously, the downside then is you don't know particularly what has helped uh, as you're using two different uh, treatments. However, if it's a rapid resolution like you've seen in those photos, it's usually neutrophilic dermatitis. Uh, keep it on your radar. Discuss with your colleagues in dermatology and internal medicine. And uh, often you need to talk to a specialist dermatopathologist. We as surgeons often confuse the history and the look of these lesions with a aggressive necrotizing infection or necrotizing fasciitis, and we aggressively debride them, which unfortunately does result in nitrogenic harm. Uh, they may be associated with underlying conditions and malignancies, and that needs a, a full workup. And it's a spectrum of pathology and uh, Neutrophilic dermatosis with pyodema gangrenosum is deeper and that heals with scarring as opposed to sweet syndrome. So thank you for your time.